Hey, what is up? Welcome to this episode of the Entrepreneur to Entrepreneur podcast. As always, I'm your host, Brian Lofermento. And if there's one thing that I absolutely love about entrepreneurship, it's that it has the power to change the world, whether we're talking on a societal level or in today's episode, you're going to hear from an amazing edupreneur, an educational entrepreneur that is changing the game and the landscape of education, one business, one entrepreneur, one mission at a time. So let me tell you, all about today's guest. His name is Chase Eskelson. Chase has spent over a decade in various educational positions. He started his educational career as an administrator focused on strong operational metrics and scaling full-time online schools, both charter and district schools. Upon leaving the school management position, he supported nationwide ed tech company with one foot in the academic policy world and the other in governmental affairs supporting digital educational options. That's the cool thing about entrepreneurship is we have the ability to bridge these different domains. Here we're talking today about something that impacts all of our lives, education, and something that is often quite convoluted in the world of government. And Chase is willing to bridge all of those as an entrepreneur to make a change. He then served as the chief operating officer of an education nonprofit where he oversaw launching new hybrid schools and supporting the acquisition of educational opportunities until he started his own business in late 2021. He's going to tell us all about that. His business is a one-stop education consulting firm supporting schools and businesses and fellow edupreneurs through the Firskin Ed Mastermind programs. I'm so excited to hear not only the way that he thinks and the way that entrepreneurship is changing the educational landscape, but I think he's doing some really cool things with his own business. So I'm not going to say anything else. Let's dive straight into my interview with Chase Eskelson. All right, Chase, I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Welcome to the show. Thrilled to be here. Thanks so much. Heck yeah, you've got a lot to live up to today. I'm going to be honest. I feel so excited about our conversation. But first things first, take us beyond that bio. Who the heck is Chase? How did you start doing all this incredible work that you get to do? You know, that's a, that's a great question. It, it's it's something that's always been inside me. I've always wanted to start my own thing, whatever that thing was. I went. 10, 15 years without knowing what the thing was, but I knew that I was in education and I knew that there were parts of education that are, they're broken. And so I wanted to help fix those areas. And it really led me down a winding path that allowed me to touch a lot of really interesting areas. The way I like to say it is it's a very non-traditional career trajectory. (laughs) I don't know if that makes sense or not, but it makes sense to me because I've touched so many areas of the education landscape that it allows me to understand all the connection points. And I think that's what makes First Connect a little bit different is we understand not just the one piece of the puzzle, but how they all connect together. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. You talk about these puzzle pieces. I said it at the top of today's episode. There's so many players within the world of education. Obviously, there's the educational institutions themselves. There's governmental influences. There's policy. There's so much of it. Chase, you not only entered this world, but you decided to be a change agent in this world. Walk us down that path of all the different stakeholders and players that you saw and you identified an opportunity in and you said, you know what? I want to enter that arena and help be part of that solution. Yeah, well, again, it starts because I was in a school, right? I was uh, actively involved in running a school and supporting the team, doing all of the educational pieces. And I just kept seeing things like, this is awesome. You know, full-time online. This was way before COVID made it cool. <laughs> that was that was decade before COVID made online learning cool. We looked at this situation and we said, what can we do different? What can we do better? And so we, we implemented some of those things and we grew the enrollment from, I think it was 1,200 roughly students when I started. We grew it to 8,000 students in that school. And then we launched a second school, got them up to 6,000 students. And that was with the district program here in the state of Texas where I live. Um, and every time that I would get to an interesting spot in life where someone would come with a new opportunity, a new offer, I was really careful to always listen to what they had to say. There were times when I wasn't necessarily looking for a new role, 
but I still wanted to hear that opportunity. And I said no to a lot of opportunities. And then, you know, there were a couple that were just too good to be true. When I, when I went to the nonprofit, uh, they, they came to me and they said, look, we've seen some of the things you've done in the government and public affairs arena. We've seen some of the things you've done with launching schools. Uh, we think that online learning was really innovative a decade ago but it's not innovative anymore. So how do we take the very best of that in-person experience and the very best of that digital experience and cram those two things together? And beyond that, we also have funding available. So you can actually go and dream up something crazy and cool and, and actually make it a reality. So what when you get an opportunity like that, you, you don't say no. <laughs> you just don't say no to that. Yeah, Chase, I love that overview for so many reasons, especially because I hear behind your answers is I hear that level of excitement from you. And I think what's really interesting is that when we think of the educational landscape, we don't often think business. We don't often think entrepreneurship. And I think what's fascinating about your business is you actually facilitate the change, not only across these institutions, but with edpreneurs, edupreneurs. I want you to talk about that landscape because obviously there are businesses that are in the background supporting these associations. You talk about it before COVID made all of this stuff cool, but that's innovation at play. And obviously COVID was a catalyst. It was an accelerator for so much of what I imagine happened within the educational world. But what are those players? What are the business elements? Who are these edupreneurs and what sort of solutions are they coming up with? I, that's a, I love that question. And it's something that I'm very passionate about, something that we've made a core pillar of First Skin Ed. When I started my, my company, I started hanging out with other education entrepreneurs. And I realized that most of them were teachers or administrators who had a great idea, right? They're in the trenches every single day. They ask themselves the question, there's, you know, how do I do this better? There's got to be a better way to do this. And sure enough, they go and they figure out how to do it. And the idea is fantastic. It, it has legs, it has merit. Uh, but what I started noticing far too often was these, these education businesses were failing. And I wasn't okay with that because the idea was good. So I started digging in saying, why are they failing? What's going on here that's preventing these entities from serving students and teachers better? And I learned a really valuable lesson really early on. It's not because the ideas aren't great. It's because, simply put, these are educators, not business people. And they've, they've got no idea how to do some of those basic business principles in order to get their idea, their product, their service, whatever it is, out to market. And so we started the education entrepreneur, the edupreneur, as you've so aptly called it several times. Thank you for using our verbiage there the edupreneur mastermind. And we started bringing these folks together and sitting them down and saying, hey, you know, you, you have to have clean numbers. You, you know, you were at a school, maybe you were a principal, you always had a guy for that, right? Uh, now you're the guy. So here's how you go into QuickBooks and you utilize that tool effectively and uh, make sure that you are set up for success. So we brought in a bookkeeper and she just walked them through tips, tricks, best practices on how to use QuickBooks effectively. Uh, we then brought in a small business lawyer. And Brian, this is hilarious. When is the small business lawyer ever the rock star? Like lawyers aren't the rock star. There's jokes about lawyers. And it's probably for good reason. Uh, I, I know I've got a lot of family and friends that are lawyers, but uh, they're, they're not the rock stars normally. But in this group... They're the rock star. This guy came in and described, here's how I need you from a lawyer's perspective. I need you to prepare before coming to me. Because if you do X, Y, and Z, you are going to be so much more successful and pay me less on the long run. And so this guy was just fantastic. He described what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and when and when you don't necessarily need to use a lawyer. So fantastic. As that thing continued to grow, we realized a couple of interesting things. The kind of keynote speakers, if you will, were fantastic, but there was an additional need. And so we started a second segment of our Edupreneur Mastermind that, that we call Curated for You. And that's where our team goes out and finds product, services, ideas, opportunities, specifically curated for education entrepreneurs. Uh, 
So a great example, uh, there's a fund, the Vela Education Fund, and they do education grants for entrepreneurship. And we brought them in and said, hey, you know, here, here's our group. Here's what the makeup is. Um, all we want you to do is to, to describe to them what grants you have coming up. And then we want you to answer two questions. The first question, what is it that you all are seeing in the grant applications that's moving that down the pile? And then the inverse, what are you seeing that you say, we really like that and that moves it up the pile. So we can hopefully get some of these education entrepreneurs grants. Uh, I'm so happy to say we had six or seven of our my members last year get a Vela Education grant. So super cool opportunity. Uh, and then finally, we realize there's another segment that's missing. And so we added a third segment to our mastermind that allows uh, our members to go into the, the membership portal and submit business-related questions where we can use the, the brain power of the group to solve them. One of our more recent examples was uh, one of our members was struggling with ads on Instagram. And so they posed the question to the group and we were able to work it out real time. They shared their screen, they worked through the problem and, and it was solved. So super cool uh, structure and incredible education entrepreneurship uh, members. Um, you know, I think it's probably interesting to know who, who are our members because I think a lot of people ask that question like, are there enough education entrepreneurs that you could fill in a mastermind? Yeah, we, we do. And we're actually super niche. So we... Re- request that you're in the K through 16 education space somehow. Number two, we request that you are the key decision maker, right? The, the the business owner. We're not really interested in helping the managers or directors kind of move up that ladder, business owner. And then third, our kind of preference is that you are in your first three years of operation. We want to really niche down to the business owners just launching, help them get through that first three to five years, and then they're set up for success and can serve students better. Yeah, Chase, so much about not only what you've built that I absolutely love, but really that perspective. I think it's such an important thing to call out is that a lot of us, when we're in our roles, the the roles of practitioners, we don't understand all of these. You call it the business foundations. We don't know those things because a lot of people have never run a business before, which is a totally different skill set from being that practitioner, whether I'm an educator, whether I am a web designer. If I then go out on my own, I'm no longer just a practitioner. So hearing the fact that you bring all these people to together is an incredible resource for people. But I also want to call this out because I think it's so important for listeners is that hearing you talk about these grant opportunities, the world wants us to succeed as entrepreneurs. There are so many resources, whether it's grants like the Vela Education Fund, they want other people to succeed because it makes the world a better place. Good business improves the lives of all. And Chase, it's exactly your business also serves that gap. First can Ed, you want to see edupreneurs do better because it then makes makes the educational system better, which in turn makes society better, so many lives better. So I think it's important to call those resources out. I want to ask you some examples because it's clear to me that you came armed with examples here today, which we so appreciate and our listeners love that. With that in mind, what are some of those examples of educational entrepreneurial enterprises that are changing the game? Because I think for a lot of us, obviously, I've been out of the educational system for a while now. I don't have kids, so I don't see it. My niece and nephew have started school. They're in kindergarten. So I see kind of that side of the world. But for a lot of us not in education, it seems outdated. And I hope that there are amazing entrepreneurs changing the landscape. And thanks to you, I know that there are. But give us some insights into the world of whether it's ed tech or even beyond that, just educational entrepreneurial solutions. Yeah, I think one of my favorite examples right now is a, f- a good friend of mine, a member of our mastermind, Tamara Becker. She's based in the, the greater Phoenix area, and she is launching micro schools. And I don't know how familiar you are or the listeners are with micro schools, but this is absolutely taking the education industry by storm. And I got to tell you, I'm here for it. It is so exciting. Uh, it, it Here's the idea. It's a small group of students spread across multiple grade levels, learning from a very individualized manner. So Tamara uh, with Adamo Education, she's got a couple of different locations. And that's the beauty is that micro school leaders are saying, yes, I can go launch a school with 20 to 40 kids. 
but I can also launch a second one 20 minutes away and capture both kind of markets, if you will, uh, where our students are not going to sit in a classroom with 30 other kids and uh, do the drill and kill, right? I think that's maybe one of the biggest takeaways that parents had during the COVID time is when everything got shut down and everyone was sent home, they were now sitting next to their kid as the teacher was drilling and killing all day. These kids were up behind a computer for six, seven hours in some instances. And if we're being honest, the learning experience doesn't take that long. The reason that school days start at eight and end at three is because they have so much wasted time during class, in between classes, all these things. Kids could and should be done by noon, by one o'clock at the latest, right? Because they can still get the same amount of learning in, in these micro schools, but then they also get to layer on top of that their passion projects and incorporate that into their learning. Um, the other thing that's really cool and what we're seeing are folks creating amazing content uh, through digital means. You know, it doesn't even necessarily have to be online content, but it can be digital infrastructure that allows for, you know, great project-based learning. And there's a couple of different groups out there that are, are creating the video content, the interactive content that is kind of what we thought it was going to be like 15 years ago when Steve Jobs stood in front of, you know, the Apple crowd and showcased uh, the parts of an atom for one of his keynote speeches, right? Uh, that was super cool back then, but it never came to fruition. We are finally seeing education catch up with some of those pieces on the curriculum side. And what that means is these students' experience is completely different. It's not just a, a static book anymore. You get to move and touch and feel and adjust and zoom in and zoom out and understand how this piece of this science course connects to the, the greater science world around us. It's amazing. Really cool opportunities. And, and that's just two of you know 50 different things we could talk about. But education is growing and expanding so quickly. It's a, a really exciting time to be in education. Yeah, Chase, I'll tell you what, hearing your vision of education, it, it makes me believe that you said it where we all thought we'd be 15 years ago. I think that that new era, so my niece and nephew are six year olds, like I said, they're in kindergarten. And I would imagine that the educational world that they're going to go through is nothing like what we went through. I think about the technology. So as someone who has an Apple Vision Pro, I caved. I've got to be an early adopter. I see how much that is changing our ability to learn something. Chase, the other day, I learned a heart stent procedure. Why? I have no idea other than it was so incredible to interact with it. And that was from a third party app that edupreneurs just like yourself and, and the people that you serve are building for the sake of teaching others. So I think it's so powerful seeing all of that. And that last point that you made, I want to pick on that. And I want to go so much deeper there because you talked about building those connections that maybe we may not previously have seen because we did live in such a fragmented educational world. Chase, our listeners know that we always ask our guests, what's your zone of genius? I love your answer because it touches to that point. Connecting seemingly non-connected facts to tell the whole story. Talk to us about where you picked that up over the years and over your career and what that means to you in the work that you do, especially in, I'm going to use that word again, fragmented, especially in a landscape where educational is so fragmented with the governmental influences, the edupreneurs, the educational institutions. How's that play into it all? Oh, fragmented is a perfect, a perfect way to talk about it. The problem that we see is in education, people go really, really deep on one specific area and they stay there for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, being able to come at this thing from such a, a varied background, you know, going back, I don't want to rehash my total experience, but I understand from an operational and financial perspective how different decisions that we make at a local school can impact the academics and instructional integrity of what's actually happening in front of the students. Then I layered on top of that the public and government affairs layering with academic policy, right? I was sitting with these uh, wonks that were doing 30 and 40 page stat nerd uh, I don't even know what to call it. stat nerd. Like, uh, that's all it is. <laughs> These people are doing things that are so deep 
into one specific question, but then they would turn around it and say, what, what do we do with this? And so to be able to then distill that down to a one pager, this is how you explain this topic to a school board, right? School boards are filled with non-educators in most instances. These are community leaders that don't know the ins and the outs of the educational sphere. So being able to take all of that and distill it down and then reading a bill that's been proposed and describing that back to a legislator or a policymaker saying, this is what was proposed. Here are those unintended consequences, right? We, they're, they're always there. Every bill, they're always in there somehow. And so to, to be able to look at that and say, based on how this bill is written, here's how it will impact the parents. And uh, parents need to have a voice in this thing. Uh, it's th- Here's how it'll impact the school, the principals, and the teachers. Here's how this is going to impact the students. And when you start to connect all those dots for people who usually only see the teachers and usually only see the parents and usually only see this, you know, the, the staff and say, no, 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 let's look at it holistically. Big picture, here's all those different impact points. And then running the nonprofit, now, now you're getting that business side in and understanding all the different implications of the physical structures of the businesses and the, all the, it, it added governmental issues that you have when you have to now deal with, uh, the local city and, and county, uh, crazy for lack of a better word. Like they, you know, you get into some of these cities and it's just ridiculous the amount of hoops you have to jump through to get a school launched. And so to be able to connect all of those dots back into one main thing. And that one main thing is making sure that students can have a good education that is impactful to them long beyond their last day of high school. And so that's really, from my perspective, where that all comes from is we have to connect those dots because if we don't, kids are going to stay in the same system that has broken areas and we've got to fix those. And so we have to connect those dots. It's really uh, nothing else other than it has to be done. And, And so that's where I come at it from. Yeah. Chase, I love the fact that you talked about unintended consequences of bills because where my head goes, I'm like, I'm glad you're reading these bills because you're right. I don't think anyone really knows how all of these things, whether it's legislative bills or policies within an educational institution, we don't think about those downstream effects. And I think the work that you're doing is so powerful. And you talk about those, the connecting of the dots. And that's why it's fun for me to talk to you, not only as someone who's an expert within the educational landscape, but someone who started your own business and you're part of that change in a really important industry. I can't think of many industries more important than education, which leads me to this next question, Chase. I have no idea which direction you're going to take it in, is when you identified this opportunity to be a change agent, what were your thoughts? Where did you go as far as all the different solutions you could have come up with? You could have teamed up with developers and gone into ed tech. You could have... I don't even know the landscape of it. There's so many options that you could have done, but where was First and Ed born out of? What was your thought process to arrive on? Not only do I want to be a solution, but this is the solution that I want to help bring to the world. Yeah, you know, I love the way you worded that question because there are so many different areas that really set us up for success long term. When I think about how we got to where we are today, the, the genesis of the entire organization was at the nonprofit. We had some strategic partnerships that were good in many, many instances. Fantastic. But it wasn't the exact right solution for every student. And I knew we could do better for students if we didn't have some of those kind of strategic partnerships that we were required to use. And so that was what really caused me to, to jump out on, on my own and to start this thing up. With that said, uh, I think it's really important specifically for our, you know, the listeners who are on the edge. I want to start something, but I haven't started yet, or I don't know exactly where to go. I, I, the advice that I would give was probably first set yourself up for success today so that when that opportunity lands, you're ready to go. And I'll give you a couple examples of uh, how my family did that effectively. At first, I, I can't. I can't go any further without thanking my wife because without her support, uh, none of this would be possible today. And I've put her in some crazy situations as most entrepreneurs do. They put their family in some crazy situations. 
But without her support, none of it would have been viable. And so we did a couple of things. First, we got financially set up. You know, you are obviously taking on a big risk by starting your own business. And you want to try to mitigate as many of those risks as possible. And so one of the things that we did is we got completely out of debt before I launched my business. No car payments, no credit cards, because we already had so many other risks, we didn't need any more. So that's what we did. And then we sold our house and we bought a much smaller, much older, not nearly as nice as the house we had. And my wife, again, thank you for doing that. Um, but we we paid cash for it. We did not have a, a mortgage. We got as much of our risks set aside as possible. And then we also set up several relationships. And I got to say, from from the early days, you know, my kind of anchor client who I'm still with, and I absolutely love them. They're doing, they're doing amazing work to elevate the parents' voices through the legislative process. And so I really get to stay involved in the political landscape from the education perspective. I, I made sure that with them, uh, we would be successful to support all the things that they need, as well as allowing us through First in Ed to do some of these other crazy and wild ideas. And so we set ourselves up for success there. Secondly, I would say that proximity matters. Every single opportunity that we've had through First Gen Ed has been through who we know or who those people know. <laughs> and it really matters your network as far as what you will be able to do. We're doing things today that we had no idea that we were going to do. We had, no, we had zero plan on supporting education entrepreneurs on day number one. That was not on our radar at all. But we saw that need and we saw the people around us and we said, they, they need help. And we want to help them because we have the people on, on our team to be able to do that. And so that proximity allowed us to have a new opportunity. And then thirdly, dream big. I mean, really freaking big because there is so much opportunity. And here I am three years in and I got to say, the water was not nearly as cold it was not nearly as scary as I thought it was going to be on day number one. And here we are blowing and going, coming in, you know, three and a half years in. Uh, it's awesome. For those of you who are debating or figuring out, get yourself up, set yourself up for success, get around the right people for new opportunities, and then dream really freaking big. Yes, amen to that. Chase, I want to publicly sing your praises here because kudos to you for such transparency. This is the real stuff. You're taking us behind the scenes, not only of your business side of your journey, but that personal side. I love hearing shout out to your wife. Honestly, that level of support is so key. And it's something that I hear behind closed doors so much for every successful entrepreneurial journey is, is that loving partner, whether it's a romantic partner, you're fortunate in that case, or just a partner in, in any sense that can support you along the way, which is also going to lead me right into my next question about masterminds. But I think that this stuff is the transparent truth about starting a business, hearing you put those foundational life pieces in place. That is an integral part of your success entrepreneurially. And a lot of times we want to separate those, those two, but one can support the other. And I think it's really powerful how you and your family have mutually decided this is the way forward so that you can be of service and, and a huge impact in an important industry moving forward. So Chase, with all of that said, I can can't let you go here today without first asking you as well about your business model, because I love the fact that masterminds are such a core part of what you do. I think that masterminds as a business model is going to be an emerging trend that we see in the future as as there's a lot of knowledge out there, our ability to bring that knowledge together, to grow together. We heard earlier where you talked about someone has a question and there's another member to help out or you proactively go find an expert. Talk to us about that mastermind model, what that adoption has been like for people inside of it and, and really what that experience is like because I would imagine that it's an incredible experience for everyone involved, including yourself, which is why I love this model. Yeah, it's fantastic. It is such a cool opportunity to be around other education entrepreneurs. And really, it has allowed both myself and others to have a network of people going through the same things that we are going through. And we can commiserate on certain aspects. Uh, we can cheer each other on when, when things are going well. But it also has opened up tons of new opportunities for us, both professionally, personally, uh, and for our members, because 
there are things out there that we didn't know about, but through the mastermind, we found out about them and it is actually converted into some business for both us as a business for skin ed, which, you know, we do general consulting and different things. And, and so through the mastermind, we have been able to walk in and support different members groups or people that they know, but also it has allowed us to find other people to, you know, do the conference circuit with, you know, it, it always is better. Here's a little, a little, uh, conference tip. If you're s- submitting proposals to go speak at a conference somewhere, include a bunch of different organizations in your proposal and having a mastermind of people who are all in education coming at it from different angles allows your proposal to rise up to the top of that list. And it has allowed us to speak with different members of our mastermind all over uh, and and really open up some new opportunities. One of which is we spoke at a, a mastermind, uh, master, we spoke at a conference in um, San Antonio a year and a half ago, roughly. And afterwards, we had a couple different groups come up to us and they said, hey, you know, that was really interesting. Do you do, you do that kind of t- uh, talk or discussion for schools? And if I'm being honest, I, <laughs> I hadn't done it for schools. It's not something that I've, I have done that specific area before. But as an entrepreneur, and, and your listeners will know this, you, you don't say, no, yeah, of course we do. Absolutely, we can do that for schools. And they said, uh, well, how much does it charge? Uh, how much does it cost for, for me to have you come in? I said, hey, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, you got to be quick on these things. Hey, I... Um, I actually have to run. I'm in another meeting here in a minute. Here's my car. Email me. We'll, we'll get all the details worked out. So that bought me a little bit of time to figure out how to put that package together. But ultimately, it did work out. And we did support that school. We did some professional learning opportunities for them, some professional development. And we did uh, the entire state of Texas. There's a, a network of charter schools. And we did uh, a professional learning online for the entire network, which was so cool. Chase, I love these little tidbits of behind the scenes of the way that you think on your feet and come up with these solutions. Listeners, every single one of us can use that little hidden hack that Chase just shared with us here on the air. What a brilliant way to buy time. And I'll honestly, I'm going to tag on to that because that's the hardest thing. When someone asks us on the spot, hey, how much would that cost? I'm a big believer. I'm not going to give you a price right here, right now. Let me sit down and think about it. And Chase, that is such a tactful way to do exactly that. You've been such a wealth of knowledge, honestly, and so so many different ways. And I publicly, again, I want to shout you out and give you kudos because I can see you here on video as we're talking today. Listeners may not be able to see you, but I'm sure that they can feel that you've got a big smile on your face the entire time you talk about this stuff because you care about this stuff and you're not only doing amazing work, but you're doing it from a place of wanting to be of service and, and wanting to be that change agent. I don't think I've ever said change agent in a short amount of time as much as I have here today. So Chase, huge kudos to you. I know that listeners will be keen to check out all the great work that that you're doing within the educational space and as far as other entrepreneurs who just want to get a taste of your brilliance and see how you operate on a business perspective, even if they may not be in the educational landscape, drop those links on us. Where should listeners go from here? Yeah, you want to check out our, our main website, firstskined.com. And the firstskin ed, that's a fun Danish word. I'm, I'm very Danish on both sides of the family. Uh, firstskin means peach. And peach is a, a throwback. I grew up on a peach orchard in northern Utah. So for those of you in Georgia, you definitely do not have the best peaches. Uh, but first, you know, F-E-R-S-K-E-N-E-D.com. First, you know, com. Yes, listeners, you know the drill. We are making it as easy as possible to go deep down the Chase rabbit hole. We are linking to his business website, which is firskined.com. We're linking down below to that in the show notes, wherever it is that you're tuning into today's episode. We're also linking to Chase's personal LinkedIn. It's how we initially came across his work. So if you want to connect with him, you hear this is an amazing entrepreneur who not only adds so much fun and humor to his stories, but is so transparent about the reality of being an entrepreneur and being part of that change in a really important industry. So Chase, on behalf of myself and all the listeners around the world, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. So happy to be here. Thanks again.